my name is Gabriela Milla. Well, nice to meet you, Gabriella, and welcome to the School of Hollywood. You're on a, a major hit TV show. I actually reached out to you instead of a publicist coming coming to me because it is actually one of my favorite shows uh, that's on TV right now. The comedy is so great in there. And, uh, the, you know, the story is about a, a young boy in his dream of working at a hotel. And he runs into all sorts of kinds of things from the complications of working there to dating. And you happen to be one of the people that he dates. Maximo. <laughs> exactly. He falls for Max you. <laughs> <laughs> Maximo Gallardo. I am the girl that comes to kind of uh, become a little bit of an earthquake in his life in season two of the show. Um, and I know you're a huge fan, Steve, which it was so cool. It's so cool when we get messages from fans, but they're they're always so heart felt and beautiful and lovely like the show is. Um, but I really I was really excited to come. So thank you so much for having me and, and to chat about this. So your character it comes into the show and she kind of uh, pickpockets things and takes them away. <laughs> what are some <laughs> of the cool things that you walked away from the hotel with? Um, all right, let's see. Well, she's a pickpocketer, but she's not a pickpocketer because she needs to steal. She's doing it to prove a point. She's a very politically um, active person and an advocate. And she, not unlike a lot of other, I grew up in Latin America. I'm half Honduran, half Venezuelan. And a lot, you know, I remember my dad had this big, you know, there is this kind of nationalistic, like really stuck to our roots um, feeling in Latin America that the Americans, the gringos, quote unquote, come in with their big fancy resorts and such and just kind of, steal our our culture and they kind of appropriate our culture as as if though it were kind of a costume so i think isabel's way of getting back at the big bad wolf or whatever is to steal things from this big fancy american resort in her town in mexico in her town of acapulco in mexico she thinks it's funny and fun and she's trying to prove a point so is it a real hotel that's active right now I'm sorry. I said, oh, I is you it cut a, out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I said, is it a real hotel that is active? You know what it is? We shoot at a real hotel, um, which is really cool because they paint it the entire thing pink. It's actually a pretty big, it's a huge resort as well. And when we're shooting, it's not active. No one's actually staying there. But on our hi on our hiatus, it is functioning. But when we're shooting, it's just the casting crew that stays there. So it's a lot of fun. Oh, very, very cool. You get the run of the place. Um, oh, yeah. So tell me about uh, you auditioning for for the series. Did you have to test for it? Uh, or did they just give it to you? Or <laughs> They just called me. We're like, hey, do you want to play Isabel? No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, the audition process of it was such a beautiful experience because I had actually quit acting and had left acting for, for a while. I, I funnily enough decided to quit or to take a break from acting uh, right before the pandemic hit uh, at the end of 2019, around like November, 2019. I was, I was pretty burnt out with the process, with the auditioning process. I felt like it wasn't a very healthy relationship that I had with auditioning or with my career anymore. So I, uh, after, after a lot of thinking and kind of like almost against my own will, but knowing it was the best for me, I took a step back and I blinked and two years had gone by. And within the two years, I wasn't really actively auditioning theatrically, but I was creating my own content. Acapulco, as you know, is a bilingual show. We speak both, we're very fluid between English and Spanish on the show. And that's the content that I was creating during the break, funnily enough, because I'm a big bi believer in bilingual content. It's how my brain works. It's how I know a lot of my friends' brains work. So I created a bilingual podcast and I was really creatively fulfilled, but I wasn't really auditioning for any TV or film. And then the I was living in Miami. I lived in Miami during the pandemic and having a blast. And finally, in a, a year ago, in January 2022, I decided, all right, I think it's time to move back to LA. Um, not come back to acting, but just move back to LA and kind of get my roots back in. And that's when this audition literally just fell on my lap. It was, it came from this casting director who I adore. Her name is Susan Bash. I'm not sure if you're, you're yeah, yeah, Susan, with her. Great, great casting. Legend in Hollywood. She's amazing. She's an amazing casting director and she's big on comedy. I had, I had, I had tested 
for her throughout the years for different comedies and had gotten really close to getting parts on on network te television comedies and for cameras but never anything quite congelled either the pilot wouldn't go through or just you know I was one of the last two candidates and I would test for the studio and wouldn't make it or whatnot and when I saw the audition fall into my lap and, lap and I saw it was Susan I was like okay I love Susan I gotta send a tape for Susan and I read this scene of Isabel and it's actually the audition scene. The first scene of the audition scene was the first scene that she has on the show where she's stealing pens. Um, and Maximo Gallardo, the, our, our leading man, uh, catches her stealing pens from the hotel. And I just thought she was adorable and she was fun and spunky and she was everything. I love acting, uh, everything I love about acting, everything I love about women in general, you know, just very unapologetic. And I sent a tape and about a week later, I got a, a, a call that I was going to be reading in for producers and the producers are amazing. And it was so cool because it was a producer session on Zoom via Zoom. And half of the producers were, you know, you can, you know how you can swipe through your Zoom yeah, yeah, and you yeah. can see people. Yeah names and it was so cool because 50% of the producers were Hispanic names and that's like you know I've been I've been auditioning in, in Hollywood for a while now you really don't get 50% of, of a producer session all being Hispanic names and that was really really exciting uh to me and then you know the producers that were American-based were just like these legends right Austin Weinsberg and Chris Harris who I'm a huge fan of and Jay Harris who's our uh, director and one of the executives producers just all these huge names and then on the Mexican side all these behemoths of um you know comedy like Eugenio Derbez and Eduardo Cisneros so that was really exciting but I think they were a little concerned on the Mexican side of things that I wasn't authentically Mexican I'm Honduran and Venezuelan so, you know, they really, really liked me, but I think they were concerned about authenticity. Um, but I still got to chemistry read with Enrique, who's our fabulous Maximo, who's just an amazing leading man, uh, about a week later. And everything kind of, there's so many little funny stories within the, the testing process that I don't know if you want me to like, you know, this story can sure, go this, on forever. This but is it was School of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> School of Hollywood. Yeah. Well, my manager calls me to tell me, listen, the producers love you, but they're concerned you're not Mexican. They're really concerned that, you know, authentic they want someone authentically Mexican. And by this point, I had I had taken a break for two years. I don't think I took myself or the business so seriously anymore. I was really more in it for the enjoyment. And I said, you know, if they like me, great. And if not, then I, I'd be bummed, but I can let this go. I, I just knew it wasn't life or death anymore the way I used to treat auditions. Um, and that was a really nice way to take off my shoulders because then I could enjoy the process of auditioning more. And, you know, I said, it's great. They're like, you know, they like you. They want to test you with Enrique. Chemistry read you with Enrique next week. And I had a trip planned to the Bahamas for my birthday. And... Every single year around pilot season, my birthday's in March. So every single year around pilot season, my birthday either gets trampled by a, you know, chemistry read or a studio test. And if I don't get the part, then my birthday's ruined and it's this whole tragedy. So I said, you know, I'm, I already have this trip to the Bahamas planned. I'm not going to reschedule it or cancel it because I've done that too many years. Um, so I hope, I hope the chemistry read works out with this trip. And it did. I landed back in LA um, like on a Sunday at midnight. And then the next the next day was my chemistry read with Enrique. He's a joy to work with. I think that was one of the things that excited me the most about joining the show was he's such a great leading man. And when you're going to play someone's romantic interest for a season, you really want your leading man to be at the very least likable, you know? And he is. He is very much so. He's a great actor. And the chemistry read was great. But I had landed so late the night before that there was a new second scene that they had sent me that I hadn't seen. Um, <laughs> but I think I was just the adrenaline was pumping so strong. And when they told me, are you ready for the second scene? And I realized I didn't I hadn't rehearsed or studied the second scene. I wasn't off book. I just said, let's just cold read it and have some fun. And we did, and it was a blast. And 
it went really well, but I actually, about a week after that, I got a call that I hadn't gotten the role, that they really loved me for it, but that because I wasn't Mexican, they, there were concerns. And I think I loved that part of the experience because even though I was really bummed about it, I really loved the show. I really had had, I felt great chemistry with Enrique and had had a lot of fun. Um, I kind of was just like, you know, I'll let it go. I also understand because if you want to protect someone's culture, like I understand what that feels like, but also with the frustration of, you know, I'm half Honduran, half Venezuelan. How often do they write half Honduran, half Venezuelan roles? Like not very often. So, but again, I had just, I think I had just come off of this two year acting gap where I just had a great fresh perspective about it. Again, not taking myself too seriously. So I said, all right, all right, I'm bummed, but you know, life goes on. I shed a tear or two and then that was that. And then the next morning my manager called and said, I swear to God, I wasn't lying last night, but Apple intervened and said, no, you're their girl. You're Isabel. So I got to be Isabel. And that was, that was, um, pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. It's called <laughs> the power a- of the network. <laughs> the With the final the say. Network, the power <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. ones with the money they just, control the show yeah they, exactly and then later obviously it was explained to me the other candidate who who they were going to give it to was also fabulous but i think the network they were con- the producers were concerned that the network would be concerned about my nationality and and apple tv was okay with it and within 48 hours i was in mexico you know covid testing to to get ready to prep that's a fantastic story because, you know, it is heartbreaking when you find out you just lost something, but it's even a bigger rush when you find out you, you actually got it. <laughs> yeah, I had all of the experiences in one. The yes, the no, the no, the yes. Yeah, it was pretty complete. Doing a bilingual show, how much freedom did they give you to throw in your own dialogue and say in, in Spanish that may not fit you in, in the way that it's written on, on the page? Right. I, I think our writers do a pretty exceptional job of translate translating it pretty perfectly to Spanish because a lot of the, the jokes are thought of in English, but then translated to Spanish. Of course, the writers were very much so like, if this doesn't feel natural to you, if this isn't something that you it feels like natural to hear or to say, feel free to change it. But most of the time I tried to stick to book because I knew especially on a show like Acapulco where the writers are, are just on another level. They're just on this like comedic stratosphere. You know that every single word, especially coming from the character of Isabel is very well thought out. Mm-hmm. So I remember once I had changed a line. I didn't even particularly want to change it, but one of my co-stars was like, nah, change it. It sounds kind of weird. And I remember them coming to set and being like, no, it has to be in this order. It, I was saying the same words, but in a different order and they said no it has to be in the same order because then it connects to this scene that's like you know two episodes down so I really tried to to respect um what the writers had on the page because it was so well thought. Acapulco is falling in the footsteps of, of shows like uh, The Grand Hotel, uh, Diva Maids, um, uh, Baker and the Beauty with the bilingual. Um, do you mm-hmm. see that happening more and more in television uh, in the United States. Uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts on it? And you're talking about you're producing your own stuff as well. That's bilingual. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm prime audience for bilingual uh, content. I mean, I my brain functions in English and in Spanish. I, I It's very hard for me to stick to one language. I'm cons- I always say I'm funnier, smarter, and more at ease and when I can like, you know, flow between both easily um, or swiftly, you know? If, so I was already, like I said, during the pandemic, creating my own bilingual podcast and really passionate about this, this whole generation of Latin Americans that have grown up either in the US or abroad who speak both languages fluently and feel seen. Like I know when I watched Acapulco, like I know you said you were a fan, I was a huge fan of the show because I don't even know when they're speaking English or in Spanish. I forget that Isabel is a character. 99.9 of what she speaks on the show is in Spanish because um, I'm, I'm just such a firm belief, believer of bilingual content because I'm the perfect audience for it. And I think this is just the beginning. And, and I also feel like whether you understand English or Spanish, 
one of the number one messages I get from our audience and the people who love the show is, you know, I don't speak Spanish, but I just absolutely love the show. And I absolutely love Isabel, the character. So I think you, you can really see that even if when you're not bilingual, it, it, you, you can flow right into watching it as well. So how did it feel to have that uh, heartbreak crush of losing <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Maximo? <laughs> Mr. Maximo Gallardo. It's so funny. It, I love acting in comedies because you walk off the set and you're kind of on cloud nine because this is just this kind of high level, ha ha ha, laughing, laughing. So yeah, the breakup scene day. And I remember episode seven, The Bachelor, Bachelorette, when Isabel kind of catches Julia and Maximo in a moment. Oh, that hits to heart, even, even to my heart, even to Gabby's heart, because... You know, especially because Isabel is such a beautiful character and so open and kind of uh, lovey-dovey. And even though she's this feisty character and then Maximo is such a great leading man, such a sweet romantic guy. Oh my gosh, it was so heartbreaking for me because it is this kind of love triangle where our, all the characters are really just doing the best that they can with 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 the tools that they have. So yeah, that that was not like the most fun day, but I gotta say, it, it's funny because episode nine, which spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen the show, um, which is where kind of Isabel stands her ground and there's a breakup is my favorite episode or at least one of my favorites of the of the season, because first, first of all, just being directed in that breakup scene was so masterful. Like I was directed by Jake Harris and Chris Harris and just like the adjustments they would give of like, it's a breakup and it's very heartfelt, but you're also in a com comedic world. And so that to me was just a blast. So even though as a character, you know, Isabel, I was bummed. Um, it was so, it was such a beautiful breakup scene. I loved, I loved how written, how well written it was. Well, yeah. I think Acapulco was kind of moved to Los Angeles looking at your Instagram. You would hang out with a cast of, of Acapulco here in LA. We, we do. We do. We really, it's funny. We all say it in, in interviews, we must sound like broken records, but all of us remember we're living. It's a Las Palinas behind the scenes of Las Palinas is Las Palinas. We all are living in the same hotel. We hang out breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all the cats together. So we all became really, really close. We all have seen each other out here in LA. Enrique and I are obviously very close, and and we've ever all the those relationships that you see on screen have definitely uh, translated to off screen friendships and relationships for sure. So, what's been the hardest yeah. thing for you to adjust as far as in acting your acting career? Um, is it coming from Miami to LA, or or you know getting an agent, um, or Zooms doing auditions on Zooms? You know, I've actually really liked, even though it, it's a little bit counterintuitive, I really like the Zoom and the self-tape world. I, I I haven't, I like it. Maybe it's the control freak in me that I can, I'm like in my space and I can set my lighting and I can have my script where I want it and et cetera. And I can be off book or whatnot. I, I've really kind of rolled with the punches. How, how recent, I think it's what the business was already gearing towards i remember before the pandemic i was doing a ton of self tapes maybe not as much as now but it really was it seemed to be that that was going to be our future anyway um i think when it comes to the hardest thing about acting i think is the thing that i appreciate the most about acting which is it really is a character builder um you hear no many more times than you'll ever hear yes i uh, you you know it's, it's really one of those things where it, it calls you up to the plate. It, it asks you to step up, you know, it, you either grow from the rejection or you kind of melt by it. You know what I mean? Like it's just such a character building mm -hmm. career that whether you stick to it or not, it's really going to form you and mold you as a person. And so I think a lot of the rejection, I, I can't even say it's like the hardest part about acting because even though it is, it's also like, the best part about acting because like through that pain you become a better person like a stronger person or you suck you know or you're one of those <laughs> actors who just become really jaded, you know and hate the industry and you're like everybody sucks but for me I really can say that acting as a career really really built my my character fantastic what advice do you have for young uh, latin actors oh um I guess Advice would be to create, 
create, create, create, you know, there, there's so many of us that are like, well, you know, like me, I could say like, I don't see any Honduran Venezuelans on screen. And it's like, so then be that Honduran Venezuelan that puts yourself on screen, you know, write your own content. If you don't want to write, okay, that's cool. But everybody has a talent. And if you have that, you obviously have that urge to show the world your talent. Otherwise you wouldn't want to be an actor. So then do it yourself, produce it yourself. We all have iPhones. We all have equipment that we can use. I know that I've never been more creatively fulfilled in my life. Um, more, I mean, Acapulco was pretty damn creatively fulfilling. I'm not gonna lie. So that was, so I'll, but let's put Acapulco here. But I was just as creatively fulfilled when I was taking a break from acting, but creating my own content, shooting my own comedy sketches, um, doing my, you know, bilingual podcast. I just, I believe that it stopped waiting and asking for permission to be seen um just be seen you know and latinos a lot of us have a lot to say in our comedy especially is hilarious so put yourself on screen don't wait for someone to give you the opportunity give it to yourself you know put Fantastic yourself on the advice. internet great advice sir yeah. uh where, where can people <laughs> find you in social media well, definitely on Instagram. I'm under my name. I used to be under like a pseudonym, which I missed, which meant little bean, Gavita Frijolita. But I was like, you know what? So they can find me. Let's let's put my 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 Insta handle, Gabriela Milla. And there you will find a link to my YouTube where you can find my sketches and my podcast. And I also have a bilingual podcast that I'm re-upping some of the episodes this year called Thank You X. And you can see me on Apple TV Acapulco season two as Isabel. But the big question, have you convinced the showrunner yet to come back for season three? <laughs> I know. I'm like, can Isabel just have her spinoff? No, I'm kidding. Um, well, you know, I'm just so excited to have been in season two of the show. I don't I don't see how they could top another. You know, someone asked me, would you come back for like, do you think you were, you're going to come back for season three? I'm like, I don't know. Her character arc was so amazing from season two. I don't know what they could really what else they could really write for this girl. Like. I mean, I'm, they're geniuses, but I think, I don't know, for now, her story is, seems to have closed. I haven't really heard anything else, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Knock on well, wood. Chad could use a new, boy, a new girlfriend. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Cord and I used to talk uh, about that stuff off screen. He'd be like, well, you know, maybe Chad can like, you know, have some revenge against Julia and Maximo, with, you know, with, with Isabel and we would joke about it. But, um, you know, the, the writers are so fantastic. As long as it serves the story, of course, I'd be happy to come back. But I, I remember when they were telling us the arc of, of our characters and what it was going to go, how it was going to go down in season two at the beginning of the season. And they were like, but we don't know where, you know, Isabel's story ends. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I was like, you guys, Ladies and gentlemen, you've given me a beautiful season. Like characters like Isabel come once in a million, you know? So just the fact that I got nine episodes um, is is just such more than enough of a gift for me. So so I'm happy no matter where this goes, you know? Just remember the final note here is the audience controls the network and you do great PR. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, hopefully the audience, if I come back because the audience asked for Isabel, that would be, that would be pretty epic. <laughs> that well, would be pretty it, it happened for Baker and a Beauty. That's how come Netflix picked it up. So there's no reason why you can't do it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and that's the cool thing is now with Isabel, the bar has been set so high. Like it's, it's Isabel or something even better, you know, Isabel or if it could be even better because Isabel is great, but or or just in either another character just as special or or creating my own content you know continue doing that well i look forward to seeing more stuff on you and and thank you for being on the school of hollywood thank you steve it was a pleasure i'm so happy you had me on